To learn how to code, you need to code, but how can you code if you don't know how to code? Mm. This seems like the new chicken egg problem. Don't get me wrong, I totally agree that to learn how to code, you need to code and escape as soon as possible from tutorial L, namely watching videos after videos, getting the perception that you are actually studying. So today I'm simply doing this video reaction to George Ross on the Lex Friedman podcast. He is super smart. He walks the walk. He's very knowledgeable uh, when it comes to computers and programming. So in my opinion, we should always try to listen to people who have skin in the game and who better than an actual hacker that <laughs> did something in real world. As you can see, you can dig down by yourself. Of course, he's not only an hacker. It has a company that is producing self-driving cars, comma AI, but Let's go on. Let me, let me drag you back to programming for a sec. What three, maybe three to five programming languages should people learn, do you think? Like, if you look at yourself, what did you get the most out of from learning? Uh, well, so everybody should learn C and assembly. We'll start with those two. Right, like, assembly? Yeah. If you can't code an assembly, you don't know what the computer's doing. Of course, I super agree with C. Uh, I think that learning the C programming language creates a steel frame of understanding, a steel foundation for future learnings, because you really understand how the computer actually works. When you write C code, you have in your mind computer architecture. We can say that C is just syntactic sugar for assembly. It's very, very low level, even though it's not machine code. Assembly is just a symbolic representation of the actual binary that goes inside your machine. So the C programming language is just above the um, the lowest level possible. Let's do a very stupid C program. Of course, the classic hello world application, the hello world program. So let's run it and magically we get our hello world. Simple enough. Let's watch what is really going on underneath the hood. We just have to call this object dump command. And here, my friend, we get the actual assembly code. You can directly do that, for example. This command here, we're gonna compile only until the assembly and we cut the assembly. It's exactly the same idea. Indeed, if you watch this is equal to that, but let's stick to it. So this code, my friend, is exactly what the computer is doing, is performing. So you can see you have these commands here, push Q, move Q, sub Q, leak Q, and this strange stuff, right? And here you have some names. These are actual registers. They have this strange name, ECX. As you can see here, if we search, we will find that ECX is just the name of um, of a register, okay? We have different registers which live inside your central process system, but this is low-level stuff. Very briefly, let's try to understand some of these assembly operations. We have here call Q, that stands for call a function, uh, essentially the printf. Q stands for quote, namely 64 bits word. This is an exclusive OR operation. L here stands for long. Basically, it should be, this is a 32-bit stuff. But don't quote on me, I just studied assembly long ago, I don't remember correctly. I just have the rough first principles. So I know that these are the commands and these are the actual registers. This is data movement, move long. This is a register. And this is a pointer to the actual stack, base pointer. Basically, is a data movement between uh, the RAM and the actual register. Okay, so we have these operations. We have actually atomical operations and movements of data between RAM and the registers. So you can see that underneath the hood, my simple hello world program is this, is this assembly stuff. Of course, this is just another um, abstraction because the real thing is binaries. We have opcodes and we have the actual data coming in a binary form. So for example, you can have a situation like that in which you have uh, an opcode, which is just a binary. For example, XOR has an opcode 111. Low level stuff. <laughs> As I previously said in another video, the thing that made me understand these ideas is this project here, which is from Nando Tetris. As you can see, we have many projects. And here with this course, which is totally free, you can really understand this story related to assembly opcodes and how it works. You will see that an opcode, here we have a 16-bit instruction for this little system that uh, you will create. You have these opcodes, uh, which control some logic, effectively changing how the value perform its calculation. So you have to check by yourself. I'm not sponsored, of course. <laughs> I just genuinely think that this is a marvelous course. You don't have to be great in assembly, but you have to code in it. And then like, you have to appreciate assembly in order to appreciate all the great things C gets you. And then you have to code in C in order to appreciate all the great things Python gets you. 
So all these like, assemblies in Python, we'll start with those three. Super agree. That's really nailed. That's exactly what I would say. Assembly, C, and Python. Assembly, as you saw, is syntactic sugar machine code. You have symbols, for example, XOR L, which is just a symbol for the actual bits of the opcode. Then you have C, which is a low level language, very fast, very performant. It's relatively short. We don't have a lot of features in the C programming language, even though it's tough, because when you have a lot of control, a lot of refined control, it's very easy to mess up. And C is really, really low level because you can actually turn on a single bit in a specific cell in memory. So it's kind of low level. Then you have Python, which is built upon C and it's marvelous. I like Python, but not as performant as C and doesn't really allow you to understand what is going on in your computer. The memory allocation of, of C and uh, the, the, the fact that it's assemblies give you a sense of just how many levels of abstraction you get to work on in modern day programming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. graph coloring for, for assignment, register assignment, and compilers. Yeah. Like, you know, you got to do, you know, the compiler, the computer only has a certain number of registers. Yeah, you can have all the variables you want, a C function. You know, so you get to start to build it. intuition about compilation. Yeah. Like what? We have a finite number of registers. So as you can see here, we have 32. Every register has its own specific use. And he's pointing out how can I have uh, an infinite amount of variables in a C program, even though I have a finite number of registers? So this is a low level detail that actually have uh, actual implications in the performance of your code. What a compiler gets you. What else? Um, well, then there's, then there's kind of a, so those are all very imperative programming languages. Um, then there's two other paradigms for programming that everybody should be familiar with. Um, one of them is functional. Uh, you should learn Haskell and take that all the way through, learn a language with dependent types like Hawk. So as you surely know, we have different programming paradigms. We have all these way of programming. He's talking about functional programming. Let's watch that. In this paradigm, we have functions which are first class citizen. And to make it super fast, given that this is not a tutorial, let's see an hello world in Haskell, which is the language he's talking about. So as you can see, this is the hello world in Haskell. I don't know anything about Haskell, frankly. I'd like to because for the reasons he is explaining. I don't know who said that, but it's kind of cool. It's the limits of your words are the limits of your world. So adding new words, new parody is a good way to expand, to broaden your view on how you can tackle problems, which is at the end of the day, computer science, we are just collapsing problems into code that the computer can resolve. And Haskell is your favorite functional. But is that the go-to you'd say? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a great Haskell programmer. I wrote a compiler in Haskell once. There's another paradigm, and actually there's one more paradigm. I'm not a great Haskell programmer. I wrote a compiler once. Can you believe it? <laughs> Man. Paradigm that I'll even talk about after that that I never used to talk about when I would think about this, but uh, the next paradigm is learn Verilog or VHDL. Um, okay, so here we have Verilog, which is um, a programming language designed to build actual hardware. Okay, let's ask JetGPT to build an OR gate in Verilog. So this is the actual code, an actual OR gate, which is a simple, a logic gate that allows you to perform or logic right in your code basically is this little chip you see it's built in this fashion it seems like a a little spaceship and this is an actual language very log that allows you to build actual stuff why this is cool in my opinion again i don't have an experience in very log all i know about comes from non to tetris again they have created this hdl language hardware device something i don't know here comes hardware description language. This creation of hardware allows you to really understand what is going on with your chips. So here you have a software which is logically that I used to, to use. And here you can create your stuff. You can create your actual computer. You have some chips here, a toggle. And this is an OR gate, right? This is an OR gate. So we have that electrons can pass only if one is turned on, the other is turned on or both. You see, the logic is that. On the contrary, if we take an end gate, what is going to happen here? Well, to turn on the light, you need to turn on both, right? Because this is how an end gate works. So this knowledge, working with HDL language, allows you to really understand what is going on on a cheap, low level. So having this knowledge of logic gates gives you a different approach to these operators when you write code. You perceive in your mind actually what is going on inside your computer. Is this useful? Well, you can really write code not knowing anything. You just can add the knowledge on your actual level of abstraction. So I'm talking about this. You see, to understand 
how a computer works, you have many levels. You start from electrons spinning around, you start from physics and what is the meaning of reality, how it works, to the actual application, to your actual YouTube application that you're using. In between, you have a world. You can see that transistors are at the top, just above the physics. So this is the level of Verilog and logic gates. Then we go a little upper and we have instruction set architecture. Here you understand the opcode that we were talking initially, right? When you have an opcode for a specific instruction, move L, for example, as a specific opcode. Then you raise up machine code, assembly language, programming language, the actual algorithms, and then you are at the top. So you don't need to understand everything, right? To actually write code. You can simply stay at the programming language level. You see, you just worry about understanding what are variables, what are function, how everything works, and that's it. You don't understand anything about low level stuff and you can do that this in my opinion makes you like a i don't know a monkey uh, programmer in a sense quote unquote monkey programmer because if you have any kind of problems optimization problems or something related to the operating system how the operating system handle processes and so forth you don't know actually what is going on underneath the hood. it's like driving a car you know when it breaks you don't know anything you're forced to call someone a mechanic because you don't know anything but if you are like my father that needs to do all the stuff by himself, you're gonna learn everything related to the engine of your car and when it breaks, you can actually solve the problem by yourself. It's amazing. Well, every time when my car breaks, I just call my father, which is not a mechanic, but it's like a mechanical nerd. He wants to do the stuff by himself. That's the same idea. So my goal actually is to know a little of every level. I'm not an expert in anything, if I have to say, because just becoming an expert in one level requires a lot of time to become proficient mastery only to master the programming language is actually is, is my channel goal so <laughs> every level requires a university degree so it's going to be a long way tldr get the 20 percent that encompass the 80 percent of the knowledge that you require to be a proficient programmer in every abstraction level this is my goal and this is what i plan to do i think this is a correct approach but i don't know it is only my opinion something's more about compilation and verilog is more about the hardware like g g giving a sense of what actually is the hardware is doing. Assembly C, Python are straight, like they, they sit right on top of each other. In fact, C is, well, C is kind of coded in C, but you could imagine the first C was coded in assembly and Python is actually coded in C. Um, so, you know, you can straight up go on that. Got it. Um, and then Verilog gives you, that's, that's brilliant. Okay. So, and then okay. I think there's another one now. Everyone, should, Carpathy calls it programming 2.0, which is learn a, I'm not even going to, don't learn TensorFlow, learn PyTorch. So machine learning, we've got to come up with a better term than programming 2.0 or, uh, but yeah. It's a programming language, All right? I wonder. So he's talking about Andre Karpati, who has this channel, brilliant, brilliant guy. And he used to work at Tesla and is into machine learning, artificial intelligence. I highly suggest his channel is very good. It's, it's the fourth paradigm. It's the fourth paradigm that I've kind of seen. There's like this, you know, imperative, functional hardware. I don't know a better word for it. And then ML. So TLDR, imperative, C programming language, functional, Haskell, Verilog for the actual hardware, how it's built, and machine learning stuff. That's the idea of uh, George Ots, and I agree. <laughs> I personally have the same approach, which is C, studying really, really well C, Python, which is built upon C. So knowing C, I have a steel frame of understanding of what is going on with Python. Of course, I have to study more assembly. I would like to become proficient, even though in the real world you don't use, but it's really the lowest level you can reach. You really become the actual mechanic that can <laughs> repair the car by himself. And of course, Haskell. I would like to, to take a course in Haskell just to understand super well this functional paradigm. And very log and machine learning by now, I'm not doing because, I mean, you need tremendous amount of time only to master this stuff. So this is George Ots, and I think he is worth listening to. Thank you for watching, my friend.